First, I want to thank you, all the organizers, and, and especially Juliet Kennedy, who has invited me and my colleagues here to this wonderful, wonderful uh, conference. And it's really a privilege and honor to be here. Thank you. Uh, in my paper, I'm reflecting on some features in minimalist and conceptual art that can, can be defined by the notion of simplicity. As has been evoked in many talks yesterday, the understanding of simplicity is very much bound to history. One important historical moment in the visual arts was the breaking down of the modernist ideals in the 60s. The cutting off from the previous art phase became possible by using reduction as a method of making art and by exploring the ontology of art. For a whole generation of artists, this pro procedure became essential content of their art making. The artists were no more representing or rep depicting the outer world or the invisible world behind it, like in Rachel Deleu's example of Arthur Dove, but they tried to make visible or to manifest the functioning of the world through different kinds of systems of documentation. Phenomena like gravity, weight, length, electric current, the passing of time, were approached by series of documentations. Sometimes these proceedings could be quite random, but mostly they were approached by different kinds of systems which were followed then regularly. This new way of understanding art had different names. It was called ABC art or primary structures, art as idea, or the dematerialization of art, and so on. But as was mentioned yesterday, yesterday in Juliet Floyd's paper, art became eventually even more material than before. These art movements had their inspiration in structuralism, linguistics, and analytical philosophy, and borrowed their working methods from the exact sciences. One often used method was seriality and an almost ritualistic repetition of an action or a visual element according to a chosen system. We had a good example of this kind of repetitious action when Richard Serra's film Color Aid was screened on Wednesday. By this repetition, the artist wanted to reveal and make manifest something essential in our perception and understanding of the world and, of course, of art. Despite of the aim of the artists to stick to literalness or suchness and to return to the things themselves in their art, I will argue that, in fact, in this almost boring repetitiousness, simplicity in the act evokes either uh, intentionally or not intentionally, a spiritual experience. I will use as examples the artistic attitude of Solowit, Roman Opalka, and Onkavara. All these artists have subjugated their artistic work under predefined methods that they have rigorously followed along their career. The reduction of the artistic expression to a few basic structures or actions has become the prevailing character of their work. In these artists' approach, the notion of simplicity can be understood as honesty and sincerity of idea embedded in their method and systematic way of conceiving their works. The method used in the works may seem simple but the ideas behind are philosophically complex and universal, and the visual end result can be astonishingly beautiful and fascinating. <coughs> the research concerning the meaning and the ontological basis of art became the striving force for the development of art in the 60s, especially for what was later named minimalism and conceptual art.
The latter was trying to explore the epistemology of art. Its primordial goal, in its purest form, was to make philosophical investigations of the mechanisms of how art conveys meaning. Joseph Kosuth's declaration of conceptual art as being art after philosophy expresses very concretely the shift from aesthetics to ideas within conceptual art. Both minimalism and conceptual art sought for a direct experience, stripped from any symbolic interpretation. This purge became possible with the economy of means of expression, with dull repetitiousness and seriality. The work was supposed to be seen and experienced just as it was. In the beginning of the 20th century, European modernists such as Mondrian, Malevich and Kandinsky sought to use art to reveal transcendental truths about the human condition. The new generation of artists in the 60s were considering art as a semiotic system. Paradoxically, as a consequence of their quest about the meaning of art, these artists from the 60s were also ending up to reveal universal truths. But the world of the 60s was much more ambiguous than that of the beginning of the century, as the met metaphysical thinking patterns began to be questioned and deconstructed. Bruce Nauman's neon work from 1967, The True Artist Helps the World by Revealing Mystic Truths, is a good example of this oscillation between the need to search for truth and at the same time, the awareness of the ambiguity of truth. Nauman is at the same time attesting something and questioning the assertion. With regard to this work, he has said, I quote, the most difficult thing about the whole piece for me was the statement. It was a kind of test, like when you say something out loud to see if you believe it. Once written down, I could see that the statement was on the other hand, was on one hand a totally silly idea, and yet, on the other hand, I believed it. It's true and not true at the same time. It depends on how you interpret it and how seriously you take yourself. For me, it's still a very strong thought, end of quote. The earlier artist had sought to transform the physical into the spiritual. In this sense, Malevich, Mondrian, and Kandinsky sought to use the material of their art to transcend it. For Nauman and other of his generation, in the material of artwork, there was nothing to be transcended. But while using scientific methods and flirting with philosophy and mathematics, the works became means to manifest universal ideas. There was, however, a discrepancy in the aim to strip art from any symbolic or metaphysical meaning by using scientific-like methods as art is a subjective endeavor and artists are not necessarily bound to logical procedures. As Solowit has stated in his sentences on conceptual art, I quote, artists are mystics rather than rationalists. They leap to conclusions that logic cannot reach. There was also another goal Along, along with the aim for objectivity in the use of systemic method. The modernist role of the artist as the creator of the work was questioned as well. As a counter-reaction to abstract expressionism of the 1950s, which emphasized self-expression and the artist's physical presence in the painting process, new art movements of the 60s wanted to remove the art making from the artist's personality. Conceptual art introduced art into the realm of philosophy, words and thought. Minimalism's systematic method, repetition and industrial objects 
helped to avoid the connection between self-expression and the artist's person. Nevertheless, my claim is that this process of de denying artist's role as the creator of the work succeeded only partially. Even if the artist didn't manufacture the art object by himself anymore, his ideas were crucial for the execution of the work. And in the cases of Roman Opalka and Onkavara, the artist's life is in the very center of the work. According to Solowit, the artist is like an architect, planning his works in his head and on paper, which can then be carried out using precise instructions. I quote, when an artist uses a conceptual form of art, it means that all of the planning and decision, decisions are made beforehand, and the execution is a performatory affair. The idea becomes a machine that makes the art. Art making was democratized. Whoever who would want to, to be an artist could be an artist, but only in appearance. For Solowit, it didn't matter who was actually constructing the physical work. Most of his works are executed by his assistants. The thought of the artist was the primeval force. Lewitt didn't need to make the works by himself, as the works were based on strict mathematical or geometrical patterns. The geometric sequences that in principle can be repeated at inf infinitum, the wall drawings consisting of lines arching in various ways, or the colorful wall paintings that replicate pyramid and cube shapes, are all based on an exact rational system. There is something unconditional in Lewitt's systems, in the exact geometry and calculations. Even if the process of making the works is mechanical, there is something overwhelmingly gracious and beautiful in his works. The seriality and visual repetition takes you to the reality of structures that define our world. If the idea seems to be simple, the end result can be visually very complex and beautiful. In the foreword to the catalogue of Lewitt's retrospective in 2000 in San Francisco and then in, in Whitney, David A. Ross speaks about the courageousness and honesty to which the minimalist and conceptual artists were committed in these processes. I quote, These processes seem to resonate with a generation of artists and critics who were fully ready to make the moral and ethical commitment necessary to this enormously honest way of working, end of quote. The claim for reduction of the means and content of the artwork to the minimal became a moral demand, less became more. Many artists that started their careers during the 1960s were interested in time and different kinds of numerical series. Sorry. I have a little bit more, so Roman Apalka. Roman Opalka, a Polish artist born in France, based his paintings on calculation process from one to infinity since 1965. He started painting the accumulating numbers from the upper left corner of the canvas and continued all the way to the lower right corner. Every painting, every new painting, carried on from where the previous painting left off. Every detail, as Opalka calls his works, is of the same size, which was the size of his workroom door in Warsaw in 1965. Originally, Opalka painted white numbers on black background. In 1968, however, he changed the background gray because, in his opinion, gray was not an emotional or a symbolic color in, in any way. In 1968, 
he started to make audio recordings as he was painting. He uttered every number aloud as he was painting it. In this way, the connection to time through both speech and action was emphasized. Opalka also began taking pictures of himself every day after performing his painting ritual. Opalka has stated about his working process as follows, I quote, the fundamental basis of my work to which I have dedicated my life manifests itself in a process of recording a progression that both documents time and also defines it. It began on a single date in 1965, the one on which I undertook my first detail. Each detail is a part of a greater idea conceived on that date. My work records the progression to infinity through the first and the last number painted on the canvas. The now moment, the here and just here and now, is documented many times and nothing from outside defines the utterance. In 1972, Opalka decided to make the grey background gradually paler, adding 1% white colour to the paint mixture for every new work, so that in the end there would just be white on white. During 46 years, Roman Opalka painted, documented and recorded, recorded the passing of time through the sheer enumeration of numbers. The last number that he painted before his death was 5,607,249. The appeal, appeal and meaning of Apalka's paintings, paintings could be understood by the Heideggerian way of thinking boredom. In his article, What is Metaphysics from 1929, Martin Heidegger discusses boredom as one of the states of mind where we can comprehend life's reality and sense. According to him, boredom is actually basic state of being human. Boredom was in, this, in his thinking one of the most comprehensive and prevailing states of mind, which we constantly try to avoid, but which, which actually allows us to see the truth of our being. By repeating the same act year after year, Opalka questioned our relationship, relationship to our being in the world. And at the same time, I think for the viewer, this procedure opens up also our own being in the world. Opalka foregrounds our temporal existing limitations by painting Paintings that are never ending, yet created with a finite and fading amount of time. This gesture of painting, cumulating numbers and pronouncing the number aloud reminds of a meditation practice. In the Venice Art Tempo exhibition in 2007, Opalka's number works were set side by side with an old statue of a meditating Buddha. Through this comparison, the closeness to spiritual practice in Apalka's work was evoked in a very elegant way. The idea behind on Kavara's date paintings since 1966 seems to be similar to that of Apalka's. Nevertheless, there are also many differences between the two artists. While Opalka's paintings were painted by his own hand and handwriting, Onkavara's visual expression is rather anonymous. What is common for both artists is that they put themselves and their lives in the center of their artwork. Onkavara's postcards that he posted to Ursula Meyer or other persons of the art world are stating very personal, but at the same time, common things. I'm still alive or I woke up at a certain time, are utterances that all of us could make. The theme of the date paintings is also time. Every painting contains different information concerning that special day. 
The motive of the painting is the precise date the painting has been made. The painting is set in a frame manufactured by Kavara himself. He then attaches a new clip, news clip or another thing related to that particular day to the back of the painting. On Kavara never continued the painting of the canvas in another day if it weren't finish, finished during the same day. Kavara's work, One Million Years, Past and Future, also documents the passage of time. The work consists of listing of all of the annual individual dates from the date 998,031 before Christ to the date 1,001,995 AD in a 20-volume collection of hardbound books. So there is the linearity which was also evoked in yesterday's talk, how to schematize time. The, uh, the work is divided into two parts. The first half, which Kavara began in 1979, one million years past, contains uh, the years uh, from uh, the past until 1969, and that half is subtitled for all those who have lived and died. The latter half of the project, entitled One Million Years Future, contains the years uh, uh, 969 to 1,1995 AD, and was completed in 1998. The work is subtitled for the last one. In addition to the text, textual presentation of the work, Kavara embarked on an audio recording of the work in 1993. The longest public, oh sorry, what happened? Yeah. The longest public reading from, uh, for, uh, from one million years took place at Document 11 in 2002, where female and male participants sat side by side in a glass enclosure, taking turns reading dates for the duration of the 100-day exhibition, switching between past and future. The work is an enormous homage to human existence. It stills one's sense of self in relation to the content, uh, to the constant and intangible passage of time. The whole work can be considered as a spiritual practice, and it's a very Zen-like idea. The essence in Kavara's as well as Opalka's works is to question about our relationship to time and to, to our own mortality. Death becomes the signifier of life, making our being in the world meaningful. When Susan Sontag stated in 1966 that, I quote, boredom is just the reverse side of fascination, both depend on being outside rather than inside a situation, and one leads to the other. She was talking about the minimalist repetitiousness of one and a single idea. It definitely is true that despite of the apparently boring methods of the works that I've been dealing with, they deeply touch and fascinate us. But I would rather say that this, this happens not by standing outside of the experience, but in surrendering oneself to them. The works of Solowit, Roman Opalka, and Onkavara all observe the dynamics of infinity and finitude. The repetition of a certain theme distills the relevant parts of this theme so that in the end it manifests something universal instead of something private. There is something definitely heroic and sublime in this act. In the catalogue for the exhibition Trace du Sacré at the Centre Pompidou, Deborah Jenner writes, I quote, Endless sequencing is a method of showing that the reality is essentially dynamic and that the only kind of change there is is actually a return to what already was. Thank you for your attention.